Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the pure milk of the word like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and the spiritual life. Through the knowledge of him who called you by his glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and magnificent promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Before we go to God's word this morning, let's bow our heads together and ask God's guidance on our study today. Father, we're so thankful that we have your word, that it enlightens us, it gives us an understanding of how we fit within your plan and your purpose. Father, we understand that in the very creation of man, that you knew all things, in your omniscience there was nothing that was hidden, and you had a plan, you had a purpose that you understood, you knew what all the options were in terms of the decisions man would make. And yet you created us with free will. And that was abused to rebel against you. And then sin came that brought such chaos into human history. And so you had to teach some lessons as we've studied in Ephesians 3.10, lessons that the angels needed to learn and through observation and that fallen human creatures needed to learn in their experience. Father, we need to learn these things and understand the structure of human history that you have laid out for us. So Father, as we study these things today, open our eyes, help us to understand these things that we may come to uh, see a greater, or to see great in a greater way your purpose, and what you are doing in each dispensation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as everyone knows, this is the Sunday before the Chafer Conference for 2021. The theme for this conference, if there is one, there's actually two, but the, the main theme is the topic of our keynote speaker who is Dr. Mike Stallard, who now is uh, working with uh, Friends of Israel. Now, I've known Mike a long time, uh, going back into at least, I think, the early 80s, if not the mid-80s, when he and I were both in Dallas at the same time uh, working on our doctorates. Mike went on to a tremendous academic career. He's a great researcher. He's a great teacher and a good administrator. And he taught theology for many years at Baptist Bible Seminary up in uh, Pennsylvania. Several years ago, I think it's been probably about four now, he retired from that and took a position with Friends of Israel. But while he was at Baptist Bible Seminary, he he started a new organization called the Council of Dispensational Hermeneutics. One of his areas of expertise is dispensationalism. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on Arnold Gabeline, who was one of the uh, founders, Arno Gabeline, one of the founders of dispensationalism in the early 20th century. And so he has read widely and deeply on dispensationalism. And one of his students is a good friend who has been here at numerous Chafer conferences, Dr. Bruce Baker, got his doctorate up there and wrote his dissertation in an area of dispensational thought related in some way to politics and to John Nelson Darby. And so, Bruce, I've come to respect highly because he has such a breadth and depth of knowledge of the 19th century dispensationalists. Now, all of this knowledge is important, whether we agree or disagree. And we've, certainly, we've moved things further down the field in the last hundred years as more and more uh, students of the Word have gotten together and 
studied and produced papers and hammered their way through difficult texts and refined. And I don't mean changing dispensational into something it's not, which is what progressive dispensationalism is, but in uh, developing it so that we understand it uh, more clearly and we understand it better. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, on my Friday morning pastors group, I was in Kiev and Bruce uh, volunteered to lead the discussion on dispensationalism on that Friday morning when I was flying home from Kiev. And so he went through some, some good basic stuff on dispensationalism. I was having a conversation with him and I said, yeah, I read through your slides. My slides are almost identical. We both know how to read and borrow from Charles Ryrie, don't we? <laughs> there really is nothing new under the sun, and why reinvent the wheel when somebody has done an outstanding job of building one to begin with? Well, then Bruce came back and he said, well, I really didn't finish everything. Uh, can I have another Friday morning? I said, sure, that'd be great. Less for me to do. I'm overloaded right now as it is. And so he did a second session, and although there were some things that he said that were not new, there were a few things that he did and put together in ways I had never seen anybody put things together. And I said, what? And it was a great conversation, and all the pastors just absolutely loved it. And I, I said, you made a comment in the middle of this that when you first heard this, I said, who did you hear it from? None of us originate anything. As my friend John Hintz in Tucson says, I never had an original thought that I didn't steal from somebody else. <laughs> so Bruce said, well, I got that from Mike Stallard in one of his lectures in one of his doctoral courses. I said, well, that, that was just outstanding. So I called up Mike. I said, Mike, are you going to go through this? He said, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going, going to do that. I'm going to deal with some other issues. I said, great. I'm going to steal it from Bruce. I'm going to uh, combine it with some other things. And uh, we're going to do that as the intro lesson on the Sunday before the conference starts as dispensational, uh, dispensational basics. And so that's sort of the background on what I'm going to uh, cover this morning. But if you've been around dispensationalism for more than a decade or two, and when I look around the congregation, that's true for most of you, uh, you will hear some things and see some things, especially in the second half, that you may have never heard before. I mean, I grew up in a strong dispensational con congregation, and I never heard this before, and I've studied dispensationalism and written a lot on it over the years, and I had not seen anybody put this together in quite this same way. So it's, it's very important. So that's what we're looking at this morning. We're going to ask these, uh, this question, what are dispensations, and what is dispensationalism? And I have often commented that over the last 30 or 40 years, in the realm of theology, everybody's favorite whipping boy is the dispensationalist. Why do we have a problem in the Middle East? Well, it's those evangelical dispensationalists. They're so pro-Israel. They're the problem. If they would just wouldn't be pro-Israel, we wouldn't have all this trouble. Or uh, politically, all those evangelical dispensationalists are so conservative, they all voted for Trump. See, they're just a problem. <laughs> you may laugh. I see a couple of you going, really? Yeah, really. <laughs> we, we have been for 40 years the favorite whipping boy of covenant theologians and leftist socialist progressive Christianity. And it is getting more vocal, and it is getting worse. But that's because we stick to the text. That's the issue. You have to be a biblicist and a consistent biblicist in order to be a dispensationalist. So we're going to look at these, uh, these two questions as we go forward. So what are dispensations? That's a word that is somewhat antiquated today. It's not in more modern translations. They have chosen uh, other and in some cases more accurate translations of the word. 
But we have this thing that developed from it called dispensationalism. And so what is that? Well, we'll look at that. So here's our first question. Why study the dispensations? As I pointed out when I did my most recent series on this in 2014, I entitled it God's Plan for the Ages. Because God has revealed to us that he has a plan and a purpose in human history. And as many have pointed out, human history is his story. And so it is the structure of history that we study when we are studying dispensations. It enables us to understand the Bible. Over the course of my life, I have heard untold hundreds of people tell me that once they understood two doctrines, they could understand what was going on in the Bible. And before they understood those two doctrines, it just seemed murky and muddled and confusing at times. Those two doctrines are, number one, the angelic revolt. That gives an understanding to why we have human history and the intersection between human history and what's going on in terms of the angelic revolt. And the second one, which has to really be linked with the first one, is dispensationalism. And the third thing that we learn from studying dispensationalism is that it reveals the profound corruption and sinfulness of human beings and the grace of God. Now that doesn't mean that other systems of theology and systems of doctrine don't believe in the corruption of man and the sinfulness of man, the sinfulness of sin. You'll often hear that phrase, the sinfulness of sin, in Reformed congregations, those who are more conservative and truly believe in, they call it total inability, which we disagree with, but total, the total depravity of man. But it's against that backdrop of our sin and our rebellion against God and understanding how deep and profound it is that we understand the grace of God. And in studying the dispensations, as you'll see this morning, one of the things we see is that in the progress of the dispensations, God begins with one way of controlling or constraining or restraining sin, and it doesn't work. And then he goes to another, and he adds, in each dispensation, different things are added to restrain sin, and you come to the very last. And we have a perfect king, a perfect government, an almost perfect environment. We're still living in a fallen world. Everybody who starts the kingdom is saved, and yet it ends with, with an innumerable host rebelling following Satan and rebelling against Jesus Christ. Each dispensation shows how sin has corrupted us so much that we cannot fix it in any other way than the cross. And that's why it's so important. So that's what we're going to end up with. So the word dispensation derives from the Latin word dispensatio, which has the idea of dealing something out, weighing something, dispensing something, or to distribute something. For example, if you go to a pharmacy, they will dispense your medicine. Okay, they're distributing it. And in another sense, they're administering it. But we'll get to that as we develop our understanding. So that's, what it, that's the basic idea of the Latin word. The English word, coming from Webster's Third International Dictionary, first meaning, it's a divine ordering and administration of worldly affairs. Notice they put the first meaning is something related to God. It's the divine ordering and administration of worldly affairs. That's the key idea. When you think of dispensation, or if you're reading in New King James Version, you read the word dispensation, if you've seen in our study of Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, that in both of these passages, I translated the word administration. It is not as nebulous a concept as dispensation for most readers. 
Second, it's a system of principles, promises, and rules divinely ordained and administered. So here the second definition. Now you do know that when you have more than one definition in a dictionary, they're not giving you options per se. They're telling you that the most often, the, the most common usage is the first meaning. The second most common usage is the second meaning. The third most common usage is the third meaning, and so on. The third meaning is a period of history during which a particular divine revelation has predominated in the affairs of mankind. So it has this focus on a particular divine revelation. Now we're going to come back to talk about that a little bit later on, but that's important. There is something revelatory that is distinctive about each dispensation. Fourth, it's just any general state of or ordering of things. And one thing I like to add is a dispensation takes place in time, but it's not necessarily related to time. It is in some sense. We talk about the administration of Richard Nixon. Does administration carry the idea of time? No, but if you characterize it as the administration of Nixon, you know that it was bordered by his election in 68 and when he resigned in whatever that was, 74, I think. So what is a dispensation? It comes from the Greek word oikonomia. Now, if you think about it, if you were to sound it out, oikonomia, economy, you can see that we get our English word from the Greek word oikonomia. It is a combination of two words, the Greek word namas and the word oikos. Namas means law or rule or standard or principle, and oikos means house. Now, a wooden translation of that would simply mean house law, house management, house administration, or maybe house rules. And we get our word economy from oikonomia. Now, some of you may remember, I don't know if they still teach this, but they used to teach home economics back when I was in high school. And that's where you would, you would take that class and learn how to manage a home. You would learn uh, things related to, to cooking, purchasing groceries, cost, management, budget. All of those different things were part of home economics. And it, that's the same idea that you get with this range of meaning in oikonomia. So this idea of house rules, now think about this, when you, some of your parents, some of your grandparents, some of you aren't parents or grandparents, but you were a kid, so everybody can understand this. When you're in a home and you've got mom and dad and various kids, whether it's one or ten, you have different rules for the kids. And if you have more than one kid, you may have a 10-year-old and a 1-year-old, or a 10 let's make it a little different, 10-year-old and a 6-year-old. The rules for the 6-year-old are not the same as the rule for the 10-year-old or the 15-year-old. They're going to change as they grow older. And the kids understand that. The young ones want to grow up so they can do what big brother or big sister is doing. They understand that it has something to do with age and movement, but the house laws, uh, generally, the main principles stay the same as you grow older. But some of the details may change. You're still given limitations, but some of the limitations aren't as rigid as you get older as they were when you were younger. So we have this idea of house rules, and that applies in dispensations because as God moves us through different periods of history, some things are going to stay the same, and some things are going to be different. Now, that's a really important statement, because in the class that we had a few weeks ago, there was someone who raised the issue, say, yeah, well, there's something that goes through every one of them. That needs to be on this chart. No, it doesn't, because that's not the purpose of the chart. And, the, the, and when you study dispensations, what's important are not the things that stay the same. What's important are the things that are different. You look at a shrub and you look at a tree, 
what makes the what what makes one thing a shrub and one thing's a tree is what they have that's different, not what they have that's the same. And so as you move through history, certain things are going to stay the same and certain things are going to change. And the things that change tell us that we've gone from one dispensation to another dispens- dispensation. So what we've seen here is that, number one, the it's a dispensation or the idea of a dispensation is the action of administering or ordering something. It's dealing out or distributing something. Second, it's the act of administering or dispensing with some requirement. Um, Webster's Electronic Dictionary states, in terms of a definition of economy, it's the management of the resources of a community, a country, etc., the disposition or regulation of the parts or functions of any organic whole. The, an organized system or the management of household affairs. So it's the management of the resources of the community. What's the community? The community is the church. Or the community was Israel. Or the community was just all of the Gentiles prior to the flood. That's the community. And then you have the idea of, of managing the resources. That, it, that has to do with the physical life as well as the spiritual spiritual life, and part of that emphasizing administration again, it's not a time word. The emphasis in dispensation is on the administration, and only as a secondary background idea is time there. Because you'll ask most people, "What's it? How do you define dispensation?" Well, it's a period of time. That's the first word out of their mouth. No, it's not a period of time. It's an administration. And a secondary tertiary idea is that that administration is going to be bounded within certain temporal frameworks. But but you have other words like kairos and chronos that are time words. But this is talking about what happens within those temporal boundaries. So what is a dispensation? Well, it's usually translated when it is translated as management or stewardship or administration or dispensation. Those are the dominant words, and administration is probably the most likely. I was thinking of another example that applies to many of us right now. You can go to a location where they will dispense or administer the COVID vaccine. See, I, dis, you have no trouble understanding dispense or administer in that context. They are synonyms. That's the idea. Now, we just don't use dispensation in quite that sense. But we understand the idea of a new dispensation because we just saw a shift in a presidential administration in January. And we can talk about different presidential administrations down through history. And when you go from one presidential administration to the next, there are some things that stay the same and that there are other things that are different. It's the different things that sometimes we worry about. So let's define dispensationalism. Some years ago, I was asked to write a short article defining dispensationalism for the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible. I know some of, you, some of you have that. If you look at Genesis 6 on the opposite page, there, there's the article that I wrote. And I defined it this way, and I modified this from Dr. Ryrie's definition. A dispensation is a distinct and identifiable administration in the development of God's design for human history. It is distinct and identifiable. You can, it's going, that indicates it has specific characteristics that distinguish one from another and, and anyone can identify those distinctions. And it is part of human history. It's part of God's design and purpose. And the idea is that God manages or administers the entire history of humanity as a household, moving humanity through sequential stages of his administration. And in each of these dispensations, God delegates to a human administrator. For example, in the first dispensation, which is usually described as innocence, the administrator is Adam. Then 
We have sin in the fall, and you have the next dispensation, which is conscience. And the administrator is Adam and his descendants. And then you go through each dispensation, and there is a, an administrator. So in the church age, it's the church. In the age of Israel, in the age of Israel under the law, it was Israel. Now, the word oikonomia is used nine times in the New Testament. And back when I taught this in Ephesians, I think it was around Lesson 86, related to uh, Ephesians 3, uh, 3 and 4, uh, 2, uh, 2 and 9, uh, I think it was, it was at verse 2, I went through all of these, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to pick on the first one, which is when Jesus uses the word. There's a couple of other times he uses it in parables, but this is uh, strong enough to illustrate it. But these are the passages where we have this noun, Luke 16, 2, 3, and 4, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Ephesians 1, 10, 3, 2, and 9. So Ephesians, for a shorter book, has the most uses, Colossians 1.25 and 1 Timothy 1.4. In Luke 16, 1 and 2, we catch the main emphasis of this. The idea of a steward is an administrator. So Jesus begins this parable, and he says to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, had a, had a manager, had an administrator. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him in and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship or your administration, your management, for you can no longer be the administrator. So when we look at the, just these two verses, we can make certain conclusions about a, an administration or management how this word is used, this word oikonomia. First of all, there are two parties that are involved. There's the party that has the authority to delegate responsibilities, and that is the homeowner, the householder, household owner, and he has the authority to delegate responsibilities to the manager, and he is responsible to carry out those duties. So responsibility is inherent in each dispensation. Second, there are specific responsibilities. They're spelled out, they're identified. He has a job description, and he is held accountable to fulfill his job description. That's in verse 1. Third, there's accountability for carrying out that job description. He's responsible to carry it out, and he will be held to account. Uh, as the homeowner says here, give an account for yourself. Give an account for your administration. So at any point in time, the steward may be called upon to explain how he has fulfilled his responsibilities. That's in Luke 16, 2. And then third, or fourth, a change can be made at any time if unfaithfulness is found. Now what we see just in looking at this is that there's, uh, there's responsibilities... There's a test or evaluation. There's an accountability moment where there's either a pass or fail. And then there can be a change in the administration. So that is going to help us understand these distinguishing characteristics. As I pointed out in my uh, opening de part of my definition, a dispensation is a distinct and identifiable administration in the development of God's design for history. So what makes the dispensations distinguishable from each other? Well, first of all, a change in God's governmental relationship with man and a corresponding change in man's responsibility to God. So God is going to make some modifications to the way he is relating to humanity. And there is also a change in man's responsibilities. Now, how do you know that? How do you know this change? Do you just feel it? You get a little liver quiver. Oh, God is changing the way he's doing something. No, that's the second point. Revelation explaining the change. 
God is going to inform the human race, either through a representative or directly, that he's changing things. When the Israelites were at the foot of Mount Sinai, they all heard the voice of God, scared him to death, and said, no, Moses, you go up there, listen to God. We don't want to hear that anymore. But they heard that. They knew things were changing and weren't going to be the same way that they were before. Uh, When God called Abraham, nobody else in the world knew that a dispensation was changing. Have you ever thought about that? The rest of the world just goes right on under the uh, parameters of the Noahic covenant and the change and the establishment of nations from the Tower of Babel. But nobody else knows that God's only going to start working through through Abraham and his his descendants and not through anybody else. But it's it's clearly a, a change, but it comes from revelation. Now, the revelation mostly comes in the form of covenants, and we've gone through that in the past, uh, but that's how it's done. You have the creation covenant, then after the fall, the covenant with Adam, uh, then you have the covenant with Noah, then you have the covenant with Abraham, then you have the covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai, and then you come into the New Testament. Now, there's not really a specific covenant. Now, a lot of people say new covenant, but the new covenant doesn't really go into effect until the millennial kingdom because it's with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. That's not us. Okay, so something changes, though, because there is new revelation. What was the first part of that new revelation? It was Jesus Christ, God incarnate. You know, no one had seen God at any time, but the only begotten, he has explained him. That's revelation. He's called the logos, the word. The, I'm a, what a, other word can you find that sums up revelation? So there's that. And then there's the New Testament revelation that's given through the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20, which we've studied already. So revelation explains the change. Next, there's a test to see if man will obey. There's an evaluation. There's accountability. And in each dispensation, man fails. What does that demonstrate? The corruption and sinfulness of sin. Because in each dispensation, God is going to add another layer uh, of of, uh, restraint for sin. All the way to the end. And no no level of restraint works. We all fail the test. So that's part of the lesson we're learning. Fourth, mankind refuses to obey in every dispensation. That's called sin. It's rebellion. One of the Hebrew words for sin is just that. It's avon. It means rebellion. Fifth, there's judgment upon man's disobedience. There are consequences for man's disobedience. After the first dispensation, Adam and Eve are taken out of the garden and prohibited from returning. After the flood, I mean, at the end of the next dispensation of conscience, there's the worldwide flood. That's judgment. Uh, At the end of the next dispensation, Uh, of human government, there's the Tower of Babel and the scattering of languages, and then God calls Abraham. And then you have promise and you have the law, etc., and we'll see all those in just a minute. So there's this judgment upon man's disobedience. Now those are the distinct and identifiable characteristics of, of a dispensation. So what are the just general basic information about the dispensations. So we've looked at what a dispensation is. Uh, I didn't really address the question of what is dispensationalism, so I will do that now. I don't have a slide on this. But Dr. Ryrie was asked one day, coming out of a faculty meeting at Dallas Seminary in the late 50s or early 60s, somebody else on the faculty said, well, how would you define dispensationalism? What are the distinctives that make you a dispensationalist. So he thought about it. When he wrote the initial edition of his book, which was at that time called Dispensationalism Today, now it's just called Dispensationalism, I think it's in the third or fourth edition, he said there are three things that make a person a dispensational. This is a sine qua non, a Latin phrase for without which nothing. 
This is what you have to have to be a dispensationalist. It doesn't have anything to do with how many dispensations you have. In some sense, it doesn't even have to do if, with whether or not you believe in a pre-trib rapture because there are some dispensationalists that are very confused and don't understand that. Uh, they think they believe in a post-trib rapture. But other than that, you would know there was a difference. So th those are problems. And, they don't, and then there's others who call themselves progressive dispensationalists. And, you know, I didn't realize the significance of Ryrie's sine qua non until I sat in a doctoral course with Craig Blazing, who was one of the three f basic originators, inventors of progressive dispensationalism. And they were still formulating their ideas at that particular time. But we spent weeks just talking about Ryrie's sine qua non. So there's three things, and I put them in a more logical order. First of all, the main thing that distinguishes dispensationalism is we believe in a consistent, and that's the important word, a consistent literal interpretation of Scripture. Because there's a lot of people in other theological systems that believe in a literal interpretation to some degree. But in dispensationalism, we hold to a consistent literal interpretation so that when you move uh, into prophecy, we're still, uh, we're still interpreting literally that the thousand-year reign of Christ is a thousand literal years. And that when it says it, he's going to uh, live in Jerusalem, that that means the geophysical city of Jerusalem. Uh, and that Israel in the Old Testament doesn't mean the church in the Old Testament, and uh, Israel in the New Testament doesn't mean uh, the church, that it's referring to the Jews among the household of Israel. So it's a consistent literal uh, interpretation. Because we have a consistent literal interpretation, we recognize God has a distinct plan for Israel and a distinct plan for the church and that those must be kept separate, and that God will fulfill all of his promises to, that he gave and confirmed and reconfirmed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in terms of giving the land that he had outlined for Israel, for, for, but to Abraham, and also Moses gives the boundaries uh, to that in Numbers. And it's very clear what that land is, and it's where the Jewish state exists today, but it has much larger boundaries than what they have today. But God has given that to Israel in perpetuity. But there's a condition. They, they can't enjoy living there unless they are walking in obedience to God. Now, some dispensationalists I've heard have said, well, Israel, it doesn't matter today because they're in rebellion against God. They are... Uh, they're, they're, they haven't trusted in God at all, so they're apostate, and so this doesn't matter. Really? In the Old Testament, God took them out of the land under divine discipline in 586 and 722, just like he did in AD 70. Were they not God's people? In, and was the promise of Abraham null and void during the years of the captivity in Babylon? That's absurd. God is true to his word whether they're obedient or not. And they're still God's people, and he's still going to be true to his word. And to say that the current state of Israel and the Jews, it, it, just because they have rejected the gospel, means that the promises are not relevant is idiocy, insanity, and ignorance. But I've heard people, some who have darkened the doors of this church, who have held that view. They are still God's people, and those promises are still true. So the first one is a literal interpretation of Scripture. The second one is that uh, God has a distinct plan for Israel, for Israel and the church, and they're not confused and they're not the same. And the third is the one that's more abstract and difficult for people to get a hold of is the glory of God. They understand that the whole purpose of the history of humanity is to uh, the history of all creation is to glorify God. Now, where that gets fuzzy is most people don't recognize this, but if you are part of a covenant theological community and covenant theology, they say that God's purpose for history is redemptive. 
they believe that all things are for the glory of God, but they believe that God's purpose is in history is redemptive, but he's not redeeming angels, so they basically ignore angels, and until the 20th century, your Reformed theologians ignored angelology and their systematic theologies, or it was very minimal, because they're not part of that redemptive work of Christ. So that's why it makes, makes a difference. It's a more consistent application of something that others believe in, that is that we li- our purpose in life is to glorify God, but that we carry it out in a more consistent way. So now that we've gone through the three distinctives, we're going to look at general information about the dispensations. And so the first question is, how many dispensations are there? Now, there are some people who think that dispensationalism depends on how many dispensations you have, but there is no universal agreement concerning the number of dispensations among dispensationalists. The exact number is not considered vital to the system as a whole. In fact, the Dallas Theological Seminary doctrinal statement, which was written by Lewis Berry Chafer, only has three dispensations in it the law, the church, and the future kingdom. That's all that's mentioned in the doctrinal statement, although he held to seven dispensations. He was, after all, uh, disciple-trained and mentored by C.I. Schofield. Nearly everyone, whether you are a Presbyterian, a Baptist, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, whatever, nearly everyone believes in two dispensations. Anybody who doesn't, if they think there's only one, well, why aren't they going to Jerusalem to sacrifice? The cross clearly makes a distinction between what was before the cross and what's after the cross because Christians don't go to Jerusalem to to sacrifice. So there's at least two dispensations. Third, all premillennialists agree that there are at least three. Why is that? We're living in the church age. The age before the cross was the law, and the age after this is going to be the kingdom. See, premillennialists believe Christ returns and establishes his kingdom. So all premills believe there are at least three, and nearly all dispensationalists agree that there are at least five. And we'll go through those as we lay out the timeline in just a minute. But the vast majority of dispensationalists will hold to seven dispensations. That's what uh, Schofield had in the Schofield Reference Bible. That's the typical outline that you would used to get at Dallas Theological Seminary, seven dispensations. But there are a few older systems that held to uh, eight. Uh, Charles Larkin... And James Gray held to another dispensation after the millennium. I don't think there's strong exegetical support for that. And James Gray actually changed his view because he was one of the editors of the Schofield Reference Bible, and I guess uh, Schofield convinced him he was wrong. There is a... um, There have been a few others in dispensationalism that have identified the time of Christ's incarnation as a messianic period because the message changes, the test changes, and so I think that can be argued effectively as a dispensation as well. But the the usual standard is, is seven. But holding to two, three, four, five, whatever dispensations doesn't make you a dispensationalist. Back in the 19th century, one of the foremost systematic theologians was a man named Charles Hodge, who was the head of the systematic theology department at Princeton Theological Seminary. His father had taught theology there, and his son would also teach. It's the era of the Hodges. And he writes in his systematic theology, under the Old Testament dispensation, the spirit did indeed reveal the mind and purposes of God, but it was to selected persons chosen to be prophets, authenticated as divine messengers, whose instructions the people were bound to receive as coming from God. In like manner, under the new dispensation, our Lord selected 12 men. 
So see, they believe in dispensations, they just don't have those characteristics I outlined earlier that distinguish you from uh, as a dispensationalist. Now, the major objection we get from people, and one of the things I've noticed over the years is that if you're asked, why do you believe in dispensations, then most of you don't do a real good job answering that. So what I'm going to try to do in the rest of this morning is show you why you can defend your dispensational view. The, the major objection is, first of all, that dispensational divisions are not found in the Bible. See, they'll just say that. They're not found in the Bible. You can't prove it. And if you try, you're just imposing your theology and reading it into the Scripture. You're not getting it out of the Bible. You just created this independent theology, and you're reading it back into the Bible. Well, the first thing I say, oh, really? You believe in covenant theology? Yeah. Tell me, where does God reveal the covenant of works? Oh, it's not there. Oh, okay. What about the covenant of redemption? Oh, it's not there. Well, haven't you actually read your theology into the text to say that those things are there when they're not, never mentioned? But dispensationalists actually get it from the Bible. And so we're going to start off with this timeline, and we're going to fill it in. And the first place we're going to go is Ephesians 3, 2 through 5, and 8 through 11. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the, what? Dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, he's talking about a dispensation. This is the word we studied earlier, oikonomia. And he says about this dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me, in other ages was not made known. In other ages means before now. And it says in other ages, plural. There was more than one age before now. Okay? Then he says, in, in these other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed. So we have now, which is the present time, and we have before now. So that's going to give us at least two dispensations, two periods of time. Then if we go down to Ephesians 3, 8 through 10, we learn a little more. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should evangelize among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the administration of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So, the tenth verse, to the intent that now, how many of you picked that up when you were reading? Now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So we have this word administration again, or economia, dispensation in the King James. What is the dispensation or the administration, the management of the ministry or the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God? So it was hidden, past tense. So again, it's before now. Beginning of the ages, plural. There's more than one. And then we have to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church. So now we have a name for what now is. Now is the period of the church. So we have before now, there are more one or, excuse me, there's two or more ages, and now is the church age. So let's go to our timeline. We have before now and now from this passage. Before now is the period from the beginning until the beginning of the church. And now is the church age. Let's go a little further. 
Let's look at Ephesians 2, 7. In Ephesians 2, 7, we read that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice he says the ages to come, plural, more than one. Ages to come looks to the future. So what do we learn from this? We have in the future ages to come. Hebrews 2, 5 to 6 is going to add to this. In Ephesians 2, 5 we read, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? Now there's a couple of things we're going to see in this, these two verses. First of all, it's talking about the world to come. So the previous, it's talked about ages to come, now the world to come. Those are both talking about the same thing. And that will be after now. So we've got before now, now, and now we have after now. One of the things that he says about this world to come, that it will not be sub subjected to angels. Angels aren't going to be ruling it. But he goes on to say that it will be ruled by a man. It will be. It will be ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's the humanity of Christ as the son of David, the heir of the Davidic covenant and the Davidic throne, who will rule in the future age. Now, he's the God-man, but the emphasis is that he's not ruling as God. He's ruling as the greater son of David in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. So this is not talking about the, the future state, eternal state. It is talking about what we refer to as the messianic kingdom or the millennial kingdom. So let's go back and look at our chart. Hebrews 2, 5 through 6 we've learned from the scripture that there is the world to come that is going to be the same as ages to come. Now, let me ask you this. Did we impose this on the text? No, we're getting this by just looking at what the text says, the now and then. And we are in the church age. So now we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 7. Verse, uh, or, yeah, verse 5 says, Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you what are troubled rest, the, give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So what do we learn here? First of all, we've got the kingdom of God. Now we have a name for that future age. It's the kingdom. The second thing that we learn is that it occurs when the Lord Jesus is is revealed from heaven. That pretty much destroys the whole idea of amillennialism. The kingdom is revealed, uh, is, it takes place when Jesus is revealed from heaven. That also, I think, is a major problem with progressive dispensationalism. So let's look at our timeline again. From 2 Thess 1, 5 through 7, we learn that there is a future kingdom Now we go to Romans 5, 12 through 14. We're going to look at this for two different things, a lot in this passage. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. 
but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even, of, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So what we see is there's a period from Adam to Moses. And this is a period that is before the law. Until the law, sin was in the world. So you, you're going to see at least two periods here. You're going to see the law and you're going to see before it the period from Adam to Moses. Moses is the great lawgiver. God revealed the Mosaic law to him, this, the, the law covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai. So now we look at this chart. Romans 5, 12 through 14 tells us that there's an age from Adam to Moses. And that this is going to be followed by, the, uh, excuse me, we'll go to the next part. In Romans 5, 12 again, we learn that this is from Adam to Moses. And it started with sin entering the world through Adam. So there's a period before sin entered the world through Adam. So now we have a period before Adam. We have a period from Adam to Moses. Okay? And death reigns from Adam to Moses. So Romans 5, 12 through 14 also gives us this distinction before sin and sin. So now we have this period of innocence. The term innocence has two basic connotations. Number one is that they are judicially not guilty. They're judicially in innocent. Number two is that their eyes have not yet been opened. That comes, we'll see that in a minute in, the, in looking at Genesis 3 that their eyes have not be, been opened and they don't know good and evil, which is what God says. Oh, look at them. Now their eyes are open and they know good and evil. So they were innocent in that sense as well. So we have innocence, and then from Adam to Moses, there is, there is death. So we have death. We have a little stack of books over here for the law. We have the cross and then the church, and then the crown, and then the kingdom. So now let's look at Galatians 3, 17 to 18. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed, that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what we're seeing here is in this first line that the law comes 430 years later. So there's 430 years between Abraham and the giving of the law to Moses. So this promise to Abraham is the covenant that is confirmed by God in Christ. And it's called a promise Three times it's identified as a promise. So that's a good term to use. So Galatians 3.17 introduces the idea of the Abrahamic covenant as distinct from the law. So now we have the age or dispensation of promise from Abraham to Moses. So we're getting close. What are we going to do with the period between the fall and Abraham? Well, we look at two passages, Genesis 3, 7, and 22, and then Romans 2, 14 to 15. In Genesis 3, 6 to 7, and 22, we read, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Notice, the eyes of both of them were opened. So there is a change. 
And God defines it now as he, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Then the second passage is Romans 2, 14 to 15. For whom Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do, or for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So what we have here is he's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about the time period uh, before the law, and that the Gentiles who don't have the law by nature did the things that were in the law. They had a sense of morality. There's an embedded sense of right and wrong, and that is defined as their conscience in Romans 2.15. Now, that's a good term, so we're getting really close here. Romans 2, 14, 15, we're going to have conscience, and then what is coming after that? Okay, we're going to have to go to Genesis 9, 4 through 6. In Genesis 9, 4 through 6, we have the Noahic covenant, or 3 through 7, we have the Noahic covenant. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is the blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God, he made them. Okay, so there's some changes now from what went on before the flood. Now they can eat. In fact, they're required to eat of all things. And there's requirement to uh, ex execute those who have committed murder. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. So here what we learn is that the period prior to the flood is the, the primary characteristic is conscience. Was conscience able to restrain sin? Genesis 6 says every thought in their heart was evil continuously. You know, that, that evil flourished on the earth, but conscience was not enough. So now in the new dispensation, God is going to establish government as an additional, an additional thing to restrain sin. So there's supposed to be capital punishment. So that implies that you have to have a judicial system to apply this. And that would relate to all lesser offenses. So now we have the age of conscience. So that slide just flipped by there. So we have innocence, conscience, government, Promise, law, church. The trib is a continuation of the age of Israel. That would be, remember, we saw the ages to come. You have seven years finishing out the age of Israel, and then you have the kingdom. Now, the last thing I want you to note is the progression here that we see in history. Adam sinned, and they move from the age of innocence. Now it's a fallen, corrupt world. The first thing that God institutes in the coming dispensation is conscience. That's all there was to restrain sin and evil. And the result, almost 2,000 years later, is what? Every thought of their heart was evil continuously. They are so corrupt and evil that the only ones that, that, are, that God delivers from the antediluvian civilization are Adam and his three sons and their four wives. So eight people, that's it. Then at the, after the flood, you get into the period of human government, and that actually ends at the time of the Tower of Babel, when God scatters the languages and scatters the nations and establishes nations. And correlative to that, he's going to call out Abraham because he's not going to work through all of the Gentiles anymore. He's going to work through Abraham, and we have the dispensation of promise. So God promises a deliverer to deal with the sin problem, but there's still no restraint that for sin. 
And then we get into the law. God gives the law to restrain sin in Israel. Does it work? No. So we, we've got, still have conscience. We still have government. We have the promise of God uh, of redemption and forgiveness. And we have the law, but it still isn't enough to restrain evil. And when God sends the Messiah as the fulfillment of the seed promise in the Old Testament, they crucify him. So we come to the church, and now we have a, a new entity a new organism, the church, the body of Christ that's indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. We have the completed scripture to restrain sin. Does it work? No. It's going to end up with such horrors that when we are removed at the rapture, we'll go through seven years of the tribulation. And then Christ returns and establishes his kingdom. We're going to have perfect king, perfect government, perfect education. All of the institutions will be perfect. Uh, most of the curse will be rolled back. The wolf and the lamb will lie down together, and a baby will put his hand into a cobra's den and not get hurt. Uh, there won't be disease. There won't be death other than capital punishment. It's going to be almost perfect environment. At the end, Satan's going to be released, and untold numbers are going to follow him in a rebellion against God. Christ and God, and God's going to just incinerate him with brims fire and brimstone, and that, that's the end of this earth. And then we'll go into the new heavens and the new earth. So when we look at this, this tells us why dispensations is important. And that the idea of dispensations and these specifically these seven periods of time isn't something that's imposed on this text. It is derived from the text. And it all points to sin and God's solution of the sin problem because it tells us how sinful sin is, how corrupting it is, and that the only thing that can solve the problem is the work of Christ. That's why the gospel is so important. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this today, to go through this panorama of your uh, plan uh, for human history to understand how these dispensations are identified in Scripture and to understand how uh, they show the inability of man to solve the problem and the inability of anything within creation to solve the problem, the utter corruption and sinfulness of sin, but it puts on display your wonderful grace that you have not just destroyed us all, but you have, out of your love, sent your Son to die on the cross for, for us, that we might have everlasting life, to pay the penalty for sin for all mankind with the free offer of the gospel. That's all that, that, that is necessary to have eternal life, to be a new creature in Christ, to have your sins forgiven, is to trust in Christ, his death on the cross is sufficient, and you have eternal life. Father, we thank you these things. We pray for the conference this week that all will go well. Everybody will be safe, uh, stay healthy, that you will protect us from having any outbreaks of the uh, COVID virus, and that it will be a three days when we can uh, dig into scriptures, understand the scriptures, understand the crazy things that are going on in this world right now, and so that we can have a greater impact as believers who are to shine as lights in the midst of a perverse, gener wicked and perverse generation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand to